And uh, I would like to recognize the, their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, so I was gonna say, the next slide is welcome to our first online meetup. That is not true. That's the one slide that I forgot to update. Welcome to the second online meetup. Um, lovely to have you here. Um, being an online meetup, uh, it's worth reiterating the code of conduct here. Uh, normally we talk about that a little bit in our, uh, our physical meetups, but um, as we're in a virtual space, things operate a little bit differently. So I just wanna be really clear that we don't tolerate harassment of meetup participants in any form. Uh, so we expect that all communication here is in a, inappropriate for a professional audience. Um, so things like harassment, sexist, racist, or exclu exclusionary jokes are not appropriate here at DevOps Sydney. And uh, Zoom makes it really easy for me to boot you if you're gonna do that sort of thing. So um, I haven't had to use that and I really hope I don't have to, but it is always there. All right, so tonight, uh, talks wise, we've got four lightning talks. Uh, we've got uh, the intro that we're doing now. Uh, we're gonna do lightning talk one and lightning talk two. Uh, we're gonna jump into an events and jobs section. Uh, and then we are going to do lightning talks three and four. So hope to have it wrapped up uh, by mm, about sort of 50, 55 minutes. Uh, the lightning talks for uh, this evening, each are about five to 10 minutes. We've got Mani Batra uh, talking about an introduction to a BGP sandbox. Uh, Michael Richardson is talking about expiring certificates and uh, interesting incidents that are emerging from that. Uh, we've got John Pollard uh, talking about FileMaker Pro in 2020. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to, to get an insight to how the, the other people uh, not in our industry actually do stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then we've got Davin Benfield as well. Uh, hopefully he's going to join at some point. In this case, we just cut him at the end, but we'll see how we go. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, DevOps for managers. So, yeah. quick show of hands if I can get on mute everybody. Um, who here is a... <laughs> Very good, Tom. You actually show you shook your hands. I should have probably said the question before that, though. Um, who here is a first timer tonight? I am. Excellent. There's a bunch of folks, and this will work if you don't have your video on. Okay. And awesome. Also, oh, me simply. Yep. Fantastic. Oh, we've got some new people jumping in as well while we're doing this. Lovely. And um, do we have anybody from out of state, anybody that isn't um, isn't in New South Wales joining us tonight? Hi, Lindsay. It's Tobias Brown here. I'm dialing in from Canberra. Michael Excellent. Richardson used to work at the DTA where I work and i um, very interested to hear how he's going. <laughs> Well, buckle up because you're going to see us talk in just a moment. So Canberra, I'm not sure if Canberra necessarily like counts as out of state. It's sort of an enclave within New South Wales, but we'll give that to you. Anybody further afield than, than, than ACT? No, we're all a bit shy. Actually, we've got people in the chat as well. Well, I moved here from no. India, if that counts. That, that's pretty good. You moved here from India? Yeah, anybody from uh, anybody from outside Australia on the on the call? We had somebody joining us from Singapore last month. No, we're all very shy tonight. All right, so let's just get uh, tucked straight into it. Uh, we're going to do lightning talks. Uh, so Mani is going to take it away first, uh, doing an introduction to a BGP sandbox. Uh, we're going to relinquish the screen, and Mani, take it away. Let me just get this sharing happening. Awesome, can you see my screen? You can see it just fine. Cool, so yeah, hello everyone. So as you can see, I'll be introducing some tools today to create your very own BGP playground. Uh, BGP stands for Border Gateway Protocol for those of us who are new to this, just like me. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm working as a senior solutions engineer at Section. We are an edge compute platform, which means we run your code closer to where the user is, essentially. I have my email here in case anyone has any questions or wants to get in touch. And I'm sure we can make these slides available after the talk. Uh, so the motivation for this project was my realization that I'm not as good at networking as I think I am. Also, usually when I try to learn something, I like the top-down approach where I start with the final product 
in the mine and then get down into the weight, sort of like learning baseball before you start actually learning about physics. So with that in mind, we'll be touching a little bit about DM42 and Viagra. The intention is to demystify these tools a little bit so that you can go and play with them and learn more about the glue that holds the internet together. Awesome. So getting into it, what is DN42? For this, we need to understand a little bit of what BGP is. Uh, I'll just take you to my very bad drawing. Uh, BGP is the, is the protocol on which the internet routing is based in its simplest terms. If you think of internet as a mesh of rows, then BGP it would be the GPS telling the packets where to go. So as you can see in the diagram here, like internet is, you can think of internet as a collection of machines connected together. And the major hubs in those mesh meshes are called autonomous systems. In, in the real world, that could be an ISP or a university. When you request something over the internet, like a web page, the DNS resolver resolves it to like an IP address here and then the request goes to your ISP, which if you think of it as an autonomous system, decides where to send it. In the diagram here, AS4 is the final autonomous system, which is basically announcing that if the packet has a de destination address of a.b.c.d sent to me, I am responsible for routing it to its final destination. So what DN42 is like, a group of computers are connected together using VPN tunnels to form a mini internet. And within this small network, BGP is used for routing. So it is essentially like a safe place where you can practice BGP routing and stuff without getting complaints from your ISP or taking down customer sites, which, which is something that I was looking for. Uh, let me just turn off this annotation. Cool. So going back to the, uh, let me clear this. So going back to this slide here, you can see like, so I have one of my nodes connected to this DN42 network, which has been assigned this autonomous system number. And I'm also assigned this IP range. So I'm announcing this IP range. And if a packet has a destination as one of these IPs, I am responsible for routing it. And here we have a map showing the entire DN42 network as it currently stands. And if I just search for my node, like you can see this tiny thing here is my node. And I'm connect connected to this sort of other, my peer, which is like a major hub. And the person who operates it is like really friendly and helpful. So uh, I'll just take you to my node now. So on the right here, you can see my DN, like we are hesitant to my DN42 node, and like I Money, said, can we, you make that? Can you enhance that? Make it a little bit bigger. Oh, okay. I did make it bigger, but apparently not large enough. Even bigger. Just keep going. Yeah, that's looking a bit better. Thank you. Let me make this side also bigger because. Ooh. So okay, so. Like I said, we I am this node is connected to the DN42 network and is announcing that I am responsible for that IP range. For that, we run a process called BIRD. Uh, here we are in the BIRD command line. And if we want to see what routes we routes we know about, here they are. So on the left, you can see if we are sending a packet belonging to this IP range. It'll go via this interface, which we'll touch upon a little later. And this AS number is responsible for the IP range mentioned here. And again, I do understand this is like a very high level of BIRD, but I have left some links in my slides, which it is not as hard as you think. Like I, I was in the, under the impression that there's something magical happening, but it is just simple, straightforward programming and very good documentation. Highly recommend checking it out. So going uh, to the next slide. So this is like our initial architecture. On the right, we have the DN42 network. And I had the Linode server and a computer that we call home computer. 
after my machine joined with the N42 network, it became part, it became one of the autonomous systems in the network. And yeah, so like I was a part of the DN42 network. And mm -hmm. as you as you may remember that I mentioned that DN42 is a network that is made of VPN tunnels. So next we'll be learning a little bit about that. So the technology behind those VPN tunnels is called WireGuard, and which can which has basically combined VPN tunnels with cryptography. It makes setting up VPN tunnels extremely easy, so much so that it has been included in the Linux kernel version 5.6. In, in March of this year, actually, so very, it just achieved 1.0 and was released with the Linux kernel version 5.6. So it is pretty easy. And next we will try and set up. So going back to this diagram, we'll try to connect our home computer to our instance that is running on DN42 using a VPN tunnel. And hopefully nothing breaks like it didn't yesterday. So I'll just try and draw what I'm trying to achieve. So like, we'll, oh, okay, that did not work. Hmm. For some reason I can't draw. Uh, yeah, there you go. So we're trying to, so on the left is my sort of home computer and on the right is the DN42 machine. We are trying to draw a VPN tunnel between those two. For this exercise, I'm assigning the IP address 10.0.0.1 to this machine and .0.2 to this machine. As a first step, like the first step you have to do is generate a private and public key pair, so easy to do, like has a command, and then you set it up in a configuration file. You can do everything obviously via the command line, but I'm just going to use a configuration file because as you create a lot of tunnels, it becomes easier to manage. And I'll be deleting these instances, so if someone wants to note down the private key, that is totally fine. So I have the configuration files belonging to both the machines here, and I'll just do a little bit of Annotation, oh, it works this time around. Yep. So what will basically happen is like on the left, we have this private key, which will be assigned to this interface. And this public key of the peer belongs to this machine. And the private key on the right will be assigned to the interface on the same machine and this public key belongs to this machine. So essentially you are using public key, public and private keys as a method of authentication. And we'll be listening on the UDB port 51825 for the WireGuard protocol. So with that in mind, I'm just going to clear everything. And so if we just, I, I've set up the interface on, on my machine and you should be able to see it at the bottom. So this is the interface set up here. Uh, this basically means that this interface has a link local address of 10.0.0.1 and its peer has an address of 10.0.0.2. So I'm gonna start setting it up. So the first step would be using the IP link command to add the interface here. Easy done, we just set it as type WireGuard. So we should see the interface up. It not up, but like it has been created, but it does not have an address right now. So like I did show you this con configuration file. So we'll use WireGuard to assign the configuration file to our interface. So now after that is done, the next step is assigning the addresses. So for that, we again use the IP command. And if I get this right, would be, so this will have the address dot zero dot two, and its peer will have the address of zero dot one. Cool, so now our interface has been set up, but it is, its mode is still down. So what we'll do next is 
set it up. Unknown, yet. Yeah, that means it should be up. And uh, let us look at the status. So right now you can see the interface is showing up on both the sides. Like here, I obviously have like multiple interfaces because I'm connected to other machines too. So here you're seeing the last handshake happened 18 hours ago, which basically means nothing is happening right now. Another way of checking that is just doing a TCP dump on the interface we just created, like nothing is happening again. And this is intentional because WireGuard is a very lightweight and quiet protocol and will not show any activity, activity unless you start doing something. So I'm gonna start bringing the other end of the tunnel and here we can see ICMP packets being received and re responses being sent. So, yeah, so yeah, that, that was, yeah, like our tunnel has been set up and it is, it is, I think it's a very cool piece of technology so much so that there's a company called Tailscale, which I am not affiliated to in any way, but I find their UX really awesome. So they have set up a company which allows creating, pri making private networks really, really easy. And it is free for up to 100 devices. So I would really encourage everyone to go and try it out. So just to reiterate, uh, what we saw today was like a little bit of the DN42 network, which is a mini internet for using BGP and WireGuard, which is the backbone on which the N42 is built. And you can also think of WireGuard as transit cables between various internet exchanges. I, like, I, I do hope at least some of you were introduced to some new tools. And if there are any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them. And again, here's my contact information if you want to get in touch. We've got a minute or two. Does anybody have any questions for Marnie? If so, feel free to unmute and ask away. Cool. I always like it when our presentation is really descriptive that everyone understood everything. So I was just going to ask, uh, so you've set up uh, your connection to this DN42 network yeah. um, to learn about BGP. What what experiments or what, what kind of tests have you run there or discovered or is it just yeah. learning about how BGP works generally? Yeah, like I do want to get, so you can start up using BGP communities to control your network even better, like what routes to take and everything. And another thing that I personally did was set up like my own DNS resolver on my DN42 instance so that I can access that network from my local home machine which involved playing with a DNS resolver called Unbound and playing with IP tables, which was a whole lot of fun and maybe a topic for a future talk. Nice one. Thank you. Cool, well, any other stop. questions for money while he's rolling up the screen share? Nope, all right. Thank you very much, uh, virtual golf clap for, uh, for money, for Thank folks you. who have their video on. <laughs> All right, uh, hey, somebody's even using like the, the clap emoji or the, cl the clap the reaction. I've never seen it. I've never seen that in Thank Zoom. That. Yeah. What a time to be alive. All right, uh, next up we've got uh, Michael talking about a certificate expiry problem that he's had recently. Uh, Michael, I see the control to you. All righty, let me know if you can hear me and if you can also see my screen. Can hear and see you. Wicked. All right, thanks uh, everybody. Uh, yeah, so my name's Michael Richardson. Um, many of you are, I've met over the last seven years that I've been coming along to Sydney's DevOps meetup. Some of you I haven't met, so one day I hope to meet you when we get to get together again. I don't know when that's gonna be. But anyway, I look forward to it. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for having me. Um, like I said, I've been coming along to this meetup for seven years. I've also given a number of talks at this meetup. I like it. I like participating. Uh, if we look at my last talk that I gave at the DevOps meetup, it was uh, 
January of last year, uh, so a bit over 12 months ago. I, I know that feels like about 12 years ago, but anyway, it was just over 12 months ago. Uh, my talk title here was Anatomy of an Outage. What happened and what did we learn? Like I said, many of you weren't there for it, and if you were there for it, you probably forgot about it, but here's the summary. It was a story about an expired certificate for a non-critical system that then kick-started a sequence of events that absolutely destroyed everything. And yes, that was 12 months ago. Um, very traumatic, dramatic, brings back both painful, uh, but also comical memories. Uh, every time I think of it, I also then think of like one of the greatest tweets I've ever seen. And I look for any opportunity to share this again. So here it is again, DevOps Borat back in 2011, telling us to make an error is human, uh, but to propagate it everywhere uh, in an automatic way is to be a DevOps. And that's what we're all here for, to push out errors everywhere, isn't it? Lindsay's shaking his head, some people are nodding. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, 12 months has passed. <clears throat> so many things have changed. I've moved on. I don't work for that organization anymore, but it wasn't a result of this incident, I'm, I'm happy to say. Uh, I now work at SBS. Lots of things I love about working at SBS. You know what one of the things I really love about SBS is I don't have to spend about 10 minutes trying to describe to people what SBS does. It's instantly recognizable. People know what it does. They go, cool, That's uh, I like reading SBS news. It's nice and independent. I like SBS on demand. Um, Yes, so the team I'm in, we look after a lot of these things. If uh, SBS On Demand is not working, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'll just give it a, a reboot if it's got any issues. Let's talk about a recent issue. Imagine we have a service. This is not public facing, so you don't need to worry. Your taxpayer funds weren't impacted by a service here that would have impacted the public in any way. But let's talk about it. We have staff that are accessing an internal service. The staff said, we couldn't log into this service. Uh, this service didn't really look after the identity of all these people that were trying to log into it. We had a separate system. Let's, put, let's call it an identity service. I'm trying to be vague and not specific about the technologies or the vendors that we use here. Um, I don't know why, but I'm just not. Uh, you might pick up on a few things throughout the, the rest of the talk though and be able to probably, we'll take guesses at the end if you can figure out what the technology was. Uh, so we had people basically saying, I cannot log in to this service anymore. What do I go and do? I'll go check the logs. I checked the logs. I thought it was a login issue. I'll check the logs on the identity service. Everything was a-okay. No, no, no issues here. All right. What about the logs on the, um, the actual service itself? I didn't find anything there either. Uh, and then I realized I was looking at the wrong logs. So then when I started to look at the right logs, I did find some errors. And here, all sorts of Java-y things to do with certificates, path, builder, exception, certificate, path. Uh, is my screen still sharing okay? Yeah, look, it's looking good. Okay. Um, so yeah, we can see here certificate errors. So this is starting to give away, ah, uh, something's going wrong. Uh, with the identity service, let's check it out. So from my laptop, uh, can I make a TLS connection to the identity service? I've confirmed that the service talks to the identity service over HTTPS. I've confirmed that it's what port it is. I've confirmed, I know it's Apache. I can SSH into each of these things. So I've SSH'd into the identity service, um, confirmed it's Apache. I've made a TLS connection from my laptop. I've done that in a browser. I've inspected the certificate, it's A-OK. -okay. I've done curl and wget from my local laptop to this identity service over HTTPS, it's A-OK. -okay. All right, interesting. Maybe it's not the certificate issue. Let's try and narrow it down a little bit further. What if I SSH into the instance that's running the Java service and I try and curl or wget the identity services endpoint? It's fine as well. It doesn't look like there's anything wrong with the certificate on the identity service. But you know what? It's the only bit of information I've got to go by. So let's SSH again into the identity service and let's inspect the certificate. It expires at the end of October, 2020. It's valid for another five months. This certificate looks rock solid. I'm now starting to run out of ideas. I'm really got no idea. And I'm gonna confess that I even just restarted things. I was like, oh, I've got no idea. Restart all the things. That's what, that's what a true SRE or DevOps does. When in doubt, restart. Um, but then when I was looking at the Apache configuration files, I noticed a few more things. I noticed, oh, that's right, certificates. There's intermediate certificates as well, aren't there? Oh, let's just have a look at them because I've got nothing else to go by. So let's look at, there were two intermediate certificates. If I look at the first one, we can see that it was valid 
from 2018 until 2030. I reckon that's okay. We're in 2020. Then I look at the second certificate. Oh, it's expired. Well, this is starting to become a little bit interesting. So this was a certificate that was minted in 2000 and it expired in May 30th, 2020. I wonder what's going on here. So I started doing some Googling and I found a whole bunch of stories recently that maybe some people have noticed, some people haven't noticed. It's one of the things that I wouldn't go looking for stories like this if I didn't have a reason to, but there's a company called Sectigo. Sectigo? Secti? I don't know. Sectigo. Anyway, it happens to control a root certificate that's called uh, Added Trust External CA Root. And da, 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 it expired in May 30th, 2020. So both the root certificate and its intermediary certificate both expired on uh, at the end of May this year. Now, if anyone, uh, for people that are familiar with certificates, you know that just about every certificate is going to expire at some point, whether that's a leaf certificate issued to you from a certificate authority like Digi, uh, DigiCert or Let's Encrypt or anything like that. They're going to be fine for anywhere between three months. It used to be three years, but now they're like cutting it back to 12 months. Um, there, every certificate is going to expire at some point. Intermediary certificates are also going to expire at some point. And yes, root certificates are also going to expire at some point as well. It just so happens that root certificates don't expire as frequently. Uh, as we saw, like the previous certificate that expired just recently had actually been valid for a 20 year period. Uh, so, interesting, but like it's not anything too unusual. Why did things break? Um, if we were face to face, I'd then start to take suggestions from the audience. I'm not going to do that because I think it's just not going to work. So I'm just going to keep plowing on. But think about it yourselves. At this point, with this information you've been provided, have a little think to yourselves as to what you think could have caused the Java application to just blow up. Um, because we have things in certificate management, uh, chains of trust, cross signing of certificates, all of this is in place to be able to ensure that things should be fine. All certificates should expire at some point, but we can deal with that. We hope. Most of these concepts like cross signing of certificates deal with a couple of particular challenges. Those, those are generally got to do with, well, what TLS clients, what root certificates do they trust? And when I refer to a TLS client, I refer to what, a browser, a mobile phone, when I run curl or wget, any of these commands that make a TCP connection to a TLS endpoint, they need to have what are a, a trusted set of root certificates. And they all get managed differently. They all get updated and refreshed at different cycles. Some applications bundle their own CA stores. So an example of that, I believe, is Firefox. Whereas other types of browsers, like Chrome, will rely on the operating system and it to refresh its trusted uh, certif roots, uh, certificate store. So the, the frequency of things getting updated varies quite a bit. Now, if we dive back to SBS's specific issue, I've said before, I could connect to the identity system with my browser or my wget or curl, and it was fine. But this specific one was about a Java application not talking to this endpoint. Why was that? Well, Java typically relies upon an operating system and its trusted CA store. So in this instance, we're running on Linux. The operating system wasn't super up to date, but its CA store was up to date enough that it happened to have included that newer certificate that was valid from 2018 to 2030, okay? But here was the kicker. Our legacy Java enterprise application came bundled with its own version, with its own Java JRE its own Java runtime. And this specific Java runtime included its own CA store or certificates, trusted root certificates that it would use to trust things. And if you can see there, there's the file. I've not revealed the entire path, but it's basically, uh, you can see it's timestamp, it's 2015. It's got no chance of including the uh, new certificate that was created in 2018. And, but it did have that certificate that was created in 20, uh, 2000 that expired this year. So you can see this Java application was left in a position where it basically couldn't trust the valid certificate that was on our identity system. A couple of extra things that um, 
I think are a little bit confusing. I'd like to understand a little bit better, but I sort of look at the two certificates, the two intermediate certificates that were provided by our certific certificate authority when they issued this certificate for us. And there's just an overlap period of 18 months between what is essentially an old certificate, uh, or an old root certificate to support legacy systems that don't get refreshed very frequently, and the newer C uh, CA certificate for, for newer clients. It only overlapped by 18 months. That's what it feels, I don't know. I've not really looked into it, but that feels like a little bit of a short window of overlap. The second issue I think is also problematic. Should certificate authorities be issuing certificates signed by root certificates where that root certificate will expire before that leaf certificate expires? I sort of think no, but again, I don't know this well enough. Like what are industry best practices here? Because I sort of feel like that's a bit of a pain. Um, now, you could probably argue, like could all of this have been avoided for SBS? And the answer possibly might have been, yeah, you should have been updating the <clears throat> version of Java that was bundled in with your legacy enterprise application. But here's a bit of a bonus surprise that didn't impact, impact us, but impacted a load of other people on the internet. There are certain TLS clients, when they try to make a, a, a connection to a certificate, if they're presented with two intermediate certificates, they will attempt to um, validate the first one. If that first one, fails because it's expired, a number of packages, libraries, and dependencies out there will not go ahead and check the second intermediate certificate or the root certificate it came from to see whether it was valid. And I'm pointing the finger deliberately at OpenSSL version 1.0.2 and previous. Now you could argue, ah, oh, we should not be using that old version of um, OpenSSL, and you're right, but lots of people still do. So this would have been a total surprise for a lot of people where their application was trusting far newer CA certs, uh, root certs, um, but as soon as it encountered one of those certificates failing, it would not have proceeded to check the other valid certificates in order to trust the certificate being presented by that endpoint. Let's go. I'm about to wrap up. Hopefully, this, I'm not, I've am not. i paid zero attention to how long I'm talking for. But it's a good question to ask. What are we actually monitoring here? I sort of think like, oh, you know, when, you, when you're managing a service, the basics are you should be probing that endpoint. Is your service actually running? Like is a, is, is a simple one, like, oh, does it respond? Does it respond with the desired maybe HTTP status code? Does it respond within a certain period of time? There's a bunch of basic things you should sort of check for your service endpoints. You should also check, like, is my service, does it have a, all services sh should be over an encrypted connection. Let's just make that abundantly clear. Um, and is the certificate valid? And I don't want my monitoring to fail once it, expires, I'd like my monitoring to basically tell me, hey, that certificate has got less than 30 days before it expires. That should probably be automatically renewed via Let's Encrypt or similar types of things. But now I'm starting to wonder, as of this week, do we need to start expanding this? Should we, should we be checking things like, well, for any certificates we use for any of our services, do we need to check whether any of the root certificates that this certificate came from are still valid. Are any of those going to be expiring? Because all the certificates are going to expire at some point. Um, this is like, maybe we should be starting to monitor this. Or for any applications that we manage, do we should we be checking what are the trusted root certificates that this application uses when it makes a TLS connection to a HTTPS endpoint? I'm not doing those last two bullet points. And I, I'm going to go out there and say, I don't think many people are. Um, and I sort of, I'm not proposing that we all start to go and do this. I'm just saying things break when you least expect it. I think that's probably the end of the talk. Anyway, there you go. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Not sure I can answer them, but happy to anyway. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. In the interest of keeping things moving, we might, uh, we might keep the questions in over in the, in the group chat, but a uh, round, quick round of applause for, uh, for Michael for that one. All right, we are gonna keep cracking on. Uh, so events really quickly. Um, we've got the DevOps Enterprise Summit London, which is virtual. So that's actually happening next week uh, on British summertime. And so if you're into a DevOps Enterprise Summit, it's sort of big picture DevOps strategy type things, looking at like digital transformation in other organizations with the DevOps in it. So it's sort of nice it all being online and that you can actually attend. And it's sort of kicking off about this time uh, next week. So that's pretty cool. Uh, 
Other than that, we've also got Yao data that's happening the week after next as well. Um, so that's uh, about sort of big data, data science. Uh, it's another all online event, which is lovely to see. It's happening over three days. So you can get a bit of a taste there of the, the keynotes and the invited speakers. So if you do anything with, with big data, this is definitely one of the conferences to, to try and get to um, yeah, this year, especially now that they, they're putting it all online. Uh, they've also got Lambda Jam as well, so more for people in the functional programming uh, space. Again, that's happening online as well uh, on uh, the 22nd to the 24th of next month. Uh, but it's always a ripper conference, so definitely worthwhile checking that out if you're interested in the, uh, in the functional programming world. Uh, other than that, a little bit later this year, we've got Web Directions Code Remote. Uh, again, another exclusively online conference. You probably noticed you could say here. Uh, Web Directions is, is sort of one of the most uh, well-known tech conferences in Australia. Um, and they are trying something really interesting with their format. So rather than having it as a single day or a single week, they're actually doing um, a Friday, four Fridays, four consecutive Fridays uh, from 4 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, so, uh, and they're trying to you know, do it across multiple time zones as well. So it's sort of interesting to see them innovating a bit on the, uh, on the, the format there. But uh, it's also a little bit cheaper as well this year. Generally, it's a bit of a, a pricey conference. Obviously, you get a lot for what you what you pay for. But um, yeah, interesting to see them uh, you know trying out new new formats. Uh, they so that's more of the uh, the front end, a little bit on the back end. If you're also in the product space uh, or design, uh, they've got a similar conference that they're kicking off as well afterwards uh, around product management. So uh, pretty interesting as well. All right, that's it for events. Um, I'm going to roll quickly into jobs. So quick show of hands. Is anybody uh, looking for work at the moment or is looking to fill a position at the place that they currently work at? All right, there's a few folks there. So what we're going to do, um, uh, we're going to have 30 seconds. Uh, I'm just going to... You know, it'll just be first come, first serve, really. Uh, you've got 30 seconds to either pitch yourself or uh, pitch the position that you are trying to fill. I think we had Mick with his hand up there, so I'm going to let him go first. Hello. Hey, all. My name's Mick. Um, I work at Squiz, DevOps lead. I'm going to be on the hunt for one or two people in the next few months, so I want to start talking to people now. Um, it's mostly like infrastructure um, as code, composable infrastructure, CICD, um, AWS environment. So please, please give me a yell on the Zoom group chat and we can take it offline. Thanks. Awesome. I noticed that um, VJ over uh, in the chat has put up like his, his virtual hand there. So uh, I'm assuming VJ, you want to uh, you want to talk about a position or you're, you're looking for work at the moment? And you are muted if you are talking. Or maybe you just like the hand emoji. I don't know. I'm not one to judge. All right, we'll keep rolling. Uh, next person up. I literally cannot see anybody or do anything, so we're just going to muddle our way through it. Um, I can go if you want. Go for it. All right, yeah. Hey, guys. Um, I'm Stefan. So I live in Sydney. Uh, just yeah, seeing what's out there. I have like a DevOps background, so like uh, GCP for the last three or four years and using AWS with Cloudflare, just running like WordPress websites and static websites. Um, Yes, if you have any like job opportunities going, I'm keen to see what's out there. I have heard of Squids as well, by the way, um, Mick, so maybe we can take that offline. Um, yeah, I graduated at UTS uh, IT in 2017, and I've been going to this meetup for like the last few years. And I gave a talk last year, but I'm giving a talk next month. So yeah, tune in for that. It's on WordPress security, by the way. Cool. Awesome. You're, you're giving a little bit of a preview of the previews that I'm gonna give at the end of the meetup, but thanks to fun. All right, anybody else got any positions that they're trying to fill? Tom. Hey, um, yeah, I've just moved up to Sydney last two weeks. Um, sorry, it's my dog. Um, looking for work, background, AWS, Kubernetes kind of stuff. Mostly infrastructure as code and um, infrastructure ops kind of work. So if anyone's got anything, let me know. I'll talk to you, Tom, offline. All right, anybody else want to go before we move into the last couple of lightning talks? Three, two, one. All right, 
I think that's probably it for the time being. Uh, we are going to roll into the last two lightning talks for the evening. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. John Pollard talking about FileMaker Pro in 2020. John, I'm going to stop screen sharing and cede control to you. Take it away. So are we good here? Are you seeing my screen? Not so yet, but there. there we go. Perfect. Awesome. So for those of you who know, don't know me, which is probably everyone, my name is Dr. John Pollard. I'm an author. I wrote the book Self Parenting, which is a description of the human mind uh, operating system. Parenting the inner child, it's pretty well known in that uh, area, but Today we're going to talk about FileMaker because it's I'm a fan of FileMaker. So, uh, just a little bit about FileMaker update. I don't know if anyone knows about it at all, but uh, FileMaker is owned by Claris, or sorry, owned by Apple, but it's recently been rebadged as a Claris product, so it's under Claris now. Uh, it runs on Mac and Windows. There's nothing like it. It's it's like Access, but it's it, it's so much better in a way that it's multi-platform. We just released FileMaker 19 a few days ago. Uh, if you want to check out FileMaker, there's a very generous 45-day uh, trial. And just on, they used to release a cycle every two years, and then they kind of went to one year, but now they say they're going to release every quarter, so we'll see how that goes. Now, I wanted to let you know about RC Consulting. They are, in my opinion, the premier FileMaker developers, certainly as far as training goes. Uh, they, there are, you know, 40, 30 people in their shop, but they do a lot of training. The thing that's amazing about them is, is they present something called FileMaker Starting Point, which is a free template that's so deep and so it's been developed for for 10 years at least, so it's it's super deep, and it's free, it's weird, it's free. And if you have FileMaker, you can dig into the back end of it and go for your life. So, free trial FileMaker, free template that's best since class. Uh, just to give you a little look on the uh, what it looks like, this is what they call FileMaker starting point, desktop, iPad, iPhone. Uh, it's a full CRM for businesses. It, it does everything you want. It's just like amazing. So, and uh, I just got to let you know. Then uh, something I just saw today, which blew my mind, was this video here, which I hope is going to show. It's not, uh, it's not showing. Let's see if I can reboot here or re. Um, oh, gotta be connected. All right, this isn't pretty, but uh, and I do have links on all these sites. This is a YouTube video, which does it explains all kinds of stuff about FileMaker up to the minute. But what's amazing about it, in my opinion, and I'm going back to hope that no, we're going to going to go back and refresh. Hopefully, this is going to work. The way they did the links, if you uh, this is shocking. If you go and see how they did the links, they used FileMaker and AppleScript to put all their links in. It's just unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. So, if we ever get that link to work. Uh, I want you to see that. I'm going to try it one more time from my my uh, article. No, sorry, guys. Sorry. So, uh, but no, it's a treat. It's amazing. So, this is my little version of FileMaker. And this comes as a homebrew application. Gosh, can I get this out of the way? There we go. Bah, bah. This is what I do. I'm a FileMaker geek, and this is my, uh, oh, am I? I can't get this to run because I'm sharing the screen. What's going on here? 
This is weird. There we go. All right. So I track my life 24-7. If you've heard of CRMs, this is a LRM. I can, uh, I just had this idea like in 1995. How, I wonder if I could track my life. So I sat down with FileMaker and I just started doing it. This is me up to the minute, but let's go yesterday. That's 24 seven, yes, 24 hours yesterday, 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 yesterday. So what's cool about this template is the design of it. Basically this little screen right here, I can track any human activity in clicks. So start date, end date, start time, end time. If I want a person, I go to that person. If I want a place, I go to that place. Uh, if it's a, something that costs money, I go to pennies and let's see if this works. I got all my pennies here. That's my checkbook right there. Probably don't want to look at that too long. But basically then let's, let's just do a new one. Let's just show you how it works. So find today's data. Here, so new relational. Is it a family, social, or work? Let's call it professional. Am I sending or receiving? I'm sending. Is it a person, place, or both? It's let's call it a place right now. Now we're going to call this a new place because you guys are the DevOps. So I'll just put DevOps here. Then I could fill in your details. Blah blah. Oh, gotta have a ah. This is, believe me, this is my home version here, so this is not anything in the ready for, what are you guys? I can see, call you professional, and then I'll just say computer, so. Um, some might say that we're actually religious, but continue. All right, that could be. We got a spot for that, too. Eh, why isn't this hitting continue? All right, so here's my demo messing up. All right, now I gotta do this. I'm sorry, guys. I could have made this better. Wah. I don't. I have no idea why this isn't working. Anyway, so point being, now if it's a call, an email, a meet. Let's say I we're gonna meet to discuss. Our relationship issues or in this case FileMaker so if it's a personal relationship a personal activity it's either physical emotional or mental let's say it's mental then it's I here's one self parent or I read or I log so all these uh, little drop boxes are related to the function of the of the, of the situation that you're in. So to me, what this shows you with FileMaker is you can create anything you want, just whatever you want. So I have no idea if this is of interest to you guys, but uh, I just, you know, for me, this is back to the day when you like to play with, with software and you can now create anything you want with FileMaker. So uh, I'm happy to share that with you in case you were interested. And if you did have any questions, uh, I could take them now, I suppose. Just in the interest of time, we, uh, we might kick the questions to the Zoom group chat. So if you've got any questions for, uh, for John, definitely drop them over there in the group chat for him. Thank you very much, John. Lovely to see something a bit new and interesting and different. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All the best. All right. Uh, well, next up, and last but definitely not least, we've got uh, Devon talking about DevOps for managers. I noticed that you, uh, that you snuck in just a moment ago. Do you, uh, are you ready to, ready to go, Devon?
Yep, good to go. Spectacular. Um, John, if you could stop the screen share. And... So what am I supposed to do? Click somewhere. Is it Down the bottom, I believe, you've got a share screen. I'm just looking at your little oh, yeah. bar at the top here. You know what? I'm going to go that. I yeah, think we'll do it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got Perfect. It. Lovely. Thanks, Not a problem. All right. Davin, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Let me just get the right window. Sharing. Two moments. You can all hear me good and see the screen? You can hear and see just fine. Excellent. So, um, this quick little lightning talk. Uh, for those who don't, uh, if, uh, I have presented before. I did a, a lightning talk on GCP's deployment manager quite a few months ago now, uh, sometime I think mid last year. Um, it's been been a little while coming, but I've, I've wanted to come back and do another little talk. Um, and so here we go. Um, this little talk is a bit of a condensed talk on the, on a bit of a series and some work that I frequently do as a consultant. Um, uh, and it's a bit of a manager's guide. So I'm going to hazard a guess. I would actually say normally it's like hands up if you're a manager, but that's probably going to be completely pointless at this time. <laughs> um, and typically uh, managers that have never been an engineer before uh, that this sort of uh, better suits to but for those of you that do work in one of those massive enterprises where technology isn't generally the first thought that uh, runs through uh, the uh, through the senior management uh, management's minds this is a bit of something you might be able to take to them and uh, talk to them about in sort of properly implementing DevOps. Um, a little bit about myself very quickly. So I work for Science Solutions. I'm a consultant. I'm a lead engineer there um, as well. Uh, sort of traveled quite a fair bit around Australia um, doing the entire uh, say digital nomad thing. I own a company called CFIT, which sort of helps. Uh, it's a bit of a so, so bit more of a social experiment where I um, work with small businesses and uh, uh, improve their technology uh no end uh, i used to be a mechanic i'm better with my language now so i i used to swear quite a fair bit um purely because i grew up, grew up as a bit of a blue collar uh worker there um and me and my family we all do a fair bit of taekwondo uh and various other martial arts so a bit of a martial arts family it's good fun um so straight into it we'll go tip number one and this is i've decided to divide this up into five tips i have very very recently like i have basically pulled this together in the past hour so um, i don't have the transitions as i'd like them as of yet so um the very first thing i think would be very very important for most managers to have a really good think about is Kevin, um, just before you yeah. go on are you sharing your thing full screen at the moment yes we are not seeing that Ah, uh, what do you see? Uh, we are only seeing your web browser window. You might need to redo the Zoom and actually share your entire desktop. There we go. Let me do that then. Uh, Not a problem. Thanks, Brent, for calling that out. Thank you. How's hey, that? that's much better. Nice work. Much better. Thank you. Um, I'll refrain from going back. So, uh, first up, I think it's incredibly important to understand. And like, if you ask many non-technical people or people managers and stuff, trying to implement this in their workplace, what DevOps is, I guarantee you, you're going to get a different answer every single time. There is no one answer to this. Um, and DevOps done right is a bit of a misnomer. It is certainly probably going to look quite different for any uh, business. Uh, that, like you're definitely not going to have a bank looking a lot like the way uh, Google or Amazon do their 
flavor of DevOps. And um, there is a wonderful resource. If you Google DevOps topologies, you'll find a really good team organization, um, uh, d different ways you can organize teams and uh, certainly keep an eye out for anti-patterns that they also post up on there to sort of keep, um, uh, so, so you can sort of have a look to make sure you're not falling into any bad habits or bad patterns. Um, ask why, ask why lots, why you are doing this. Why do you think this is good for you? Um, why certainly is not asked enough by anyone, I don't think. And this, um, it may annoy some people, but I think most people are probably mature enough to kind of go, you know what, if, even if they don't know why, let's go find out. Um, tip number two, figure out your business goals and purpose. This is um, sort of stepping up the ladder or up the, um, uh, the, the tree or the lineage of DevOps a bit. Um, if, uh, if you've not heard of Lean or um, uh, Dr. Deming's work with Toyota and the like, they've basically, uh, from a business point of view and a manufacturing point of view, this is a, the granddaddy of uh, DevOps. And I find a lot of the problems when I go in to consult any business, generally the problems that come in DevOps or their, their automation is up and running, but it's automating away in the wrong direction or as um, uh, someone up, brought up before, uh, you're basically using DevOps to propagate your error across your entire uh, workload. So working this out really does uh, help make sure that you are traveling in the right direction, uh, particularly when you've got enough, uh, a good amount of velocity on the automation that you've put in place. Um, don't make speed your goal. Speed is a terrible, terrible goal to have for DevOps. Um, I say, and quite a few friends of mine, uh, people who have worked for places like Amazon and Google will tell everyone speed is a terrible thing to go for. Go for quality. If you work for quality, making sure everything is built for a really good purpose and definition of quality being make is, uh, you know, something fits its perfect, its purpose really well. You'll find that speed will become a fantastic side effect um, of your work there. The third tip, don't change too much at once. Be disciplined of what you have already. Um, more than enough times, uh, and I'd imagine more than enough people here, they've uh, experienced a really roundabout or terrible way of performing a piece of work. Um, whether it's got a really obtuse uh, uh, procedure to it, whether you've got to touch 31 different systems to be able to, you know, uh, put together a customer profile. Be disciplined on following that procedure as well and as closely as possible. Because uh, this will sort of limit the amount of variables that you get in measuring and putting together a bit of a case as to why something needs to change. Um, we are not after speed yet. I reiterate that again, because if I asked more than enough managers or, you know, uh, stakeholders, why are you doing DevOps? Why are you doing agile? And almost every single one of them will go, Oh, we want to do something faster. And it's, it's not the right way to go about it. There, there's things you can do fast, but we've got to uh, sort out some other things first. Uh, don't just throw out the old unless it's ITIL. ITIL is terrible. Get rid of it. Um, no, I do just a little bit. Uh, ITIL is better than nothing. It is a procedural. Um, it, it works to an extent. If you do have ITIL in place, follow it uh, religiously as much as you can, but then understand its foibles and understand where it falls short and then work to change where it falls short. Um, change iteratively, uh, iteratively. Don't change too much at once just 
change things here and there. Try your best. You're probably not going to change uh, only one thing at a time very often, but try and sort of keep the scope limited. Change a few things and make sure that that one's that that what you are changing is forever sort of pushing you towards your business goals that you've uh, that we put together in tip two. Um, embrace change. Change is great. Um, change is going to uh, beat status quo every time. Um, some things probably don't need to change, but certainly change has got to happen somewhere. Otherwise, uh, you're just not evolving at a pace that's going to keep you in a market for a long time. Um, tip number four, and this sort of goes into the previous tip quite a fair bit, measure everything. Measure something before you change it, measure it after you change it, and measure all the bits and pieces on the procedure during your change, how long it took you to do something, uh, how long does it take to deploy something, and make sure you can always put that into a story uh, to sort of, um, I can say, uh, justify your change back to the business. A business loves to hear good stories on how you've changed something and now something's taken uh, something that took you a day and a half to do before now only takes you 45 minutes um, and it's surprising some of the smaller changes that I've put in place in various businesses do have a drastic effect um, and it really helps to uh, put that into a story to be able to tell your stakeholders and tell your managers and um, tell your superiors and even your um, uh, people that you do manage as well, uh, get them to embrace those changes as well. Um, some people may not like change a great deal, uh, but you know you kind of do have to uh, work through and make sure you justify it, uh, justifying your change to those sorts of people. Um, we'll head on to the next one. So uh, the last one, basically. When you do measure your new state, uh, say after you've changed something, compare the results with the projection towards the goals that you're basically putting together in step two. So when you change something, make sure it's changing towards something and always make that story uh, relate to the goals that uh, should have been set in point tip number two. Um, Tip number five, and the last one. Uh, I'll try and keep this a bit, uh, try to keep this one quite short for tonight. So, um, quality costs money. Expect to invest a lot. Um, more than enough, I've heard that uh, various businesses want to implement DevOps or Agile uh, to save money. This is going to lead a great deal of heartbreak for so many people. Um, generally, uh, it's not the thing they should be looking for. Um, we should be aiming for quality, uh, improving the quality of a service, improving the quality of a piece of code that you're writing, improving the, the quality of a procedure that you, that you might actually be uh, performing or even, in, even outside of the IT world. It should be, say, your customer service people should have a procedure that they follow in. They could have ways to improve the quality of that service that they provide as well. And in improving the quality, you should be reducing waste. When you aim for quality and you don't look at it, uh, you don't look for these cost cutting measures that I sort of see in a lot of places, you start reducing waste and that in turn is the mechanism and how doing things like DevOps and Agile end up saving you money. Um, you find that your people are spending less time on doing arduous, repeatable tasks. Uh, you find that uh, even in manufacturing goods, that uh, improvement of a procedure or improvement of a uh, automation or automatic mechanism to stamp out a, a car's panel you can basically reduce waste by making sure that the, uh, the cutting procedure beforehand is done more precisely. 
uh, and therefore saving in materials and therefore money in the long run. Uh, same in the IT world, uh, saving a little bit more quality into the code will improve the efficiency at which uh, a piece of code might run, might use less uh, CPU cycles, use less RAM, uh, might hit pub sub, uh, you know, a few times less, saving you money on GCP or AWS resources in the long run. Um, embrace the culture of change. Sometimes you are going to fail and failure is good as long as you figure out that you failed and learn from those lessons. Um, last one, make sure all changes lead to business goals in tip two. I can't iterate that enough. That business goals thing in tip number two is the golden part. It's the first part if you ever read like Deming's uh, path to uh, path out of disaster. It, the very first tip is implementing business goals, giving people in your organization a purpose and making them feel that they're part of a well-oiled machine that are working towards a purpose. Um, you'll be surprised and I sort of challenge anyone to walk up to, you know, speak to their managers, speak to their organization owners and ask them, what's our business goal? What, what, why, why do we exist as a business? And I think quite, quite a few people be very surprised at how many people can't answer that question. Um, and it's a very important one. Um, I feel is it sort of, it, it makes DevOps and everything work so much better. Um, and that's it. We're done. Uh, probably a little bit more boring. I'll aim for a technical one next time. Um, I am an engineer still. I write Go and Rust and other things. So uh, I'll mix it up every now and then. I'll do a few business oriented ones and engineering ones. But um, yeah, uh, any questions, uh, probably catch in the chat. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Davin. Quick round of applause. All right. I'm going to try and grab the video back. Oh, no, you've done it for me. Fantastic. All right. So uh, that is pretty much it for us tonight. Um, want to call out that for next month, we've got a bumper lineup uh, for the July meetup. That's very much a global edition. We've got uh, Sebastian calling in from Germany, uh, Matt Zai, who's going to be calling in from uh, the Bay Area, uh, Stefan, who's going to be calling in from Sydney, um, uh, Isha as well from Sydney, and uh, Roger is going to be calling in from India. So uh, very much a, a global edition, uh, which is sort of a nice thing that we can experiment a bit with now that we don't all have to be in one physical space all the time. Uh, so really interesting collection of talks, quite eclectic as well. Uh, definitely sign up to that and uh, hope to see you next month. That's it. Have a cool. lovely Thank you. rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, speakers. Thank you. Great, Great meetup. Great meetup. Thanks, guys.